Welcome to How Leaders Lead. I'm Kula Callahan here to bring you another edition of Three More Questions with David Novak. David, how are you doing this morning? It's great to be back with you. I'm doing really well. And you know, cool. we usually do these in the afternoon, uh, but it's the morning and I see that coffee cup in your hand and I am absolutely scared to death of you. You know, <laughs> you, you got that caffeine load and I have no idea what's going to be coming out of your mouth, but uh, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, we're having a great discussion today about uh, Chris Geisens, the president and CEO of Wawa, which is an incredible convenience store chain in the Northeast which has a culture like Chick-fil-A's. It's just an amazing company. And Chris is a tremendous leader. The Wawa's across the country really have become an integral part of the communities where they exist. And Chris has done an excellent job building a team and a culture that really values that. And I'm excited to dive into our questions for today. So I've got my coffee ready, David, and uh, I'm about to fire away. That's great. And you know, before you do, you're right about Wawa being a part of the community. In Philadelphia, they actually have a Wawa Day. I mean, can you believe that? A Wawa Day. And don't you just love that name? I mean, it's fun. And, it's so uh, good. But their team members are so focused on making customers happy. And, and they really do believe in each other and believe in the power of the individual. So I found Chris and the approach that he's taking to be really inspirational. Also, fun fact, before we dive into the questions, Wawa is the sixth largest coffee retailer in the entire country. And they're pretty much only in the Northeast, and they just recently expanded to Florida. But if you think about being the sixth largest coffee retailer, I mean, they're competing with Dunkin' Donuts, with Starbucks, with all these gigantic global chains. And so his commitment to people first really is paying off. Yeah. And, you know, by the way, it's great to be the sixth largest coffee retailer because there's nothing more profitable than coffee. And that, that means they're making <laughs> a lot of money as they're selling a lot of coffee. And they are famous for their hoagie, which was actually featured on Saturday Night Live. So this is a, a big time uh, company that's uh, making it happen. And they're expanding now across the country and uh, they're taking their time doing it. But uh, that's just the way how they do things there. That is how they do things. But let's wah-wah right into the first question of today's episode. <laughs> that, that's a bad one. Let's go. All right. Question number one. Wawa, like we said, is really known for their strong culture. And there's a saying that drives their culture, and it's this, friends and neighbors serving friends and neighbors. And Chris says that this concept is more than just a saying. It actually gives Wawa employees a sense of higher purpose and calling. David, how can other leaders instill this idea of higher purpose and calling into their culture? I think it first comes down to just having a deep down belief that everyone counts and that there's no one in your organization that wants to really be part of something mediocre. People like to be a part of something that's bigger than themselves. And I think the great organizations figure out what that is and then articulate it in a very, very simple way. You know, when we founded uh, Yum Brands, we had a very simple passion, and it was to put a yum on our customers' faces all around the world. We just wanted to make people happy with the food that we served and the way how we did it. And we talked about the importance of that and really drove that home. And as we had more and more success, we continued to build on that. And then we said, hey, we can make a bigger difference in the world. And we wanted to be the defining global company that feeds the world. We wanted to be a company that others would come to to try to learn about how we had had so much success growing a global business, building a recognition culture, and making a difference by feeding people in the world who really couldn't afford our food. You know, we did a big uh, tie-in and sponsorship with the World Food Program and made that our cause all around the world. And I can't tell you how gratifying it was for all of our team members to know that we were doing more than just making money. And I think uh, Chris and, and Wawa knows this deep down. The other thing that I think uh, Chris has done extremely well is that they have an ESOP program where their employees are owners. And when you're an owner, you act like owners. And uh, we try to do the same thing at Yum Brands when we, we founded the company and when we gave uh, every restaurant manager $40,000 worth of options. 
And, you know, our stock really grew. So people were really watching that stock price and trying to do everything they could to make sure that we performed well. And that only comes when you satisfy your customers. Absolutely. You know, something that you talk about a lot, David, is a noble cause. And I love this idea of higher purpose and calling or noble cause because it really does add significant meaning to the work that you do every day. I mean, when I, I, I've actually never been into a Wawa, sadly, but I will if I see one in the near future. When you think about a Wawa employee, you know, someone who's making hoagies or pouring coffee for somebody, without a higher purpose and calling, that job could be pretty monotonous and, and almost mind-numbing. But because Chris and his team had done such a wonderful job of instilling this idea of friends and neighbors serving friends and neighbors, I believe that that gives an enormous amount of fulfillment and gratitude to all of their employees, regardless of what their daily tasks are. You know, you hope that's the case, and, and I'm sure it is with the vast majority of Wawa team members. But, you know, you've got to build that noble cause and, and give as many people as you can in the organization that extra incentive that you're talking about. So that's a good point. All right, question number two. The average Wawa customer spends less than four minutes in the store, and Wawa really prides themselves on delivering that convenience to their customers. One concept Chris talks about in the episode that I think is so powerful is that you have to care for your customer's time. And I love this idea. You know, time is a very hard thing to earn these days, and pretty much every business is vying for it. David, I imagine this concept was key during your time at Yum Brands. How did you instill this idea to your general managers and what can other leaders do to better honor their customers' time? Well, Yum Brands with Pizza Hut, Taco Bell, and KFC, we were in the quick service restaurant industry. Okay? Well, quick means one thing. Quick means you need to do it fast. Um, that's why people are, are coming to you. They want the good food, good value, and they want it fast. So it's essential that you make that a priority if you're going to be successful and, and, and win in the marketplace. You know, if something's very important, you got to measure it. So at each one of our, our brands, we measured how we were doing in terms of the time it took to serve our customers. And, you know, we racked and stacked everybody on that basis and really made it a priority. We recognized people on that basis and it became a really an essential part of, of basically how we do business. And, you know, we're not the only one in the quick service restaurant industry that does that. I mean, if you've been to Chick-fil-A, I mean, they're the best in the world at it. I mean, they've got cars lined up to get into a Chick-fil-A. They've got the, you know, volumes that are like almost two and a half times higher than the typical quick service restaurant industry. And why are customers lined up out in the highway going into a drive through It's because they know once they get in that drive through line, it's going to move and they're going to get through it and they're going to get the food they want at a good price. And it all boils down to trust. You know, when you respect someone's time, they'll trust you. And when you're consistent with it, they'll come back to you again and again and again. So if people get in a Taco Bell line, they know it's going to move. If people get into a Chick-fil-A line, they know it's going to move. And that pays off in terms of customer satisfaction, sales, and ultimately profitability. Gosh, that's so good. They know it's going to move. I love it. And, you know, for people who have businesses who aren't in the quick service food industry, this concept still applies. If you are creating video content or podcasts like this, you've got to understand that time is really hard to earn. So if you're putting out content or products that take up a lot of time and don't add a lot of value, you're going to end up losing trust with customers. That's why we keep these episodes as short as we can, but pack it with value because we know that people are on the move and they don't have a ton of time. So we want to be really cognizant of what we say and how we deliver value and the time it takes to get there. All right, question number three. Chris began his career actually as an accountant, and then he was CFO at Wawa before he became CEO. In the episode, I love when you ask him about making that transition. Now, David, you were a marketing guy before you co-founded Young Brands and became CEO. How did you make that transition, and what would you say to other leaders that are wanting to move into a CEO role? Well, you're right, cool. I came up the marketing route and and I wanted to become a general manager. And, you know, frankly, I didn't have the goal of being a CEO. I wanted to be a PepsiCo division president. We had five divisions, Pizza Hut, Taco Bell, KFC, Frito-Lay, and Pepsi. And I didn't care which division I would ultimately become president of. I just wanted to be one. 
And I realized that I had to be more than a marketing person. I realized that I had to demonstrate to the powers that be at PepsiCo that I could make money, that I could uh, manage people on the front line, that I could get into the nitty gritty of, of being a general manager and being able to direct all the functions. So one of the things that I did was uh, go to my boss uh, when I was the head of marketing and sales for, for PepsiCo and basically beg for the opportunity to be the chief operating officer because that job would really broaden me and show people that I had the chance to be a general manager. And then I think when you become a CEO, really what you have in, in the organization is you have the ultimate general manager role. And you know, you're not gonna be great at every function, but what you have to do is have enough know-how in every function that you can provide good coaching and ask good questions and really help everybody achieve their maximum potential for themselves and also for the business. So you really need to make sure that you, you know each function well enough to add that value. You know, I always tell people that you're never going to be, if you're a marketing person, you're never going to be as good as a CFO or a chief information officer. You know, you're going to need people that know those functions and, and know it obviously better than you. And you need to know yourself well enough to make sure that you fill your gaps. So I always made sure that I was surrounded by, you know, a great chief uh, financial officer because that was an area that was not my background. You know, I always had great CFOs and they did a fantastic job for me. And it's one of the reasons why our company was so successful. I always also had a great chief legal officer because that's obviously something that I wasn't trained in. And they would, you know, literally, you know, help me work through a, a myriad of problems that would occur in the day-to-day -day business of, of running a, a multinational company. And, you know, I would always try to seek out the uh, people that could help me learn in areas that I didn't know as much of. Like, for example, I think I've talked in the past about how I used to meet with Warren Buffett every, every year. And he taught me a lot about how to work with the investment community and, and a lot more. So, you know, I think that's how you transition into that role. And then as, as a CEO, the work is never done. You're constantly looking for learning that's going to make you and your company better. And I call that being an active learner. You know, you're constantly seeking out knowledge. And then when you get that knowledge, you make it active by putting it to work. Dang, David Novak, we should do these in the morning more often. <laughs> I feel inspired. Yeah, well, a couple of coffees will do that before I even open up my mouth. I feel led to go call my mentor and say, teach me everything you know about finances. Because like you, I do not have that background either. But it really is such great advice to become an active learner and do everything you can to surround yourself with people that are experts in their field. Thanks again for tuning in to another episode of How Leaders Lead. We're on a mission to make the world a better place by developing better leaders. And if you carve out a little time with us each and every week, we'll help you build the confidence you need to lead well. And tune in Thursday for my conversation with Annie Young Scribner, the CEO of Wella, one of the world's leading beauty companies. And isn't that kind of fun? We're going from Wawa to Wella. <laughs> <laughs>